423. This was shown to me by an excellent teenager, and uh, it was a real blessing to me. I'd read it before, but hadn't really stuck out to me until this teenager showed it to me. And they shall teach my people the difference between the holy and profane, and cause them to discern between the clean and the unclean. This is what we're looking at here in this uh, lesson, is basically learning how to discern, that is to judge, that is to figure out in our lives the difference between that which is holy and that which is profane. What, some, what does it mean profane? What's it mean in this verse? Common. Common. That which sure. vulgar. Dirty. Dirty. You know, it's that which is unholy. It's anything which is unholy. A, um, I meant to bring a little uh, surgical instrument kit today. I forgot. I was going to bring it and uh, set up a little sterile field and go over some of the basic rules of a sterile field, but I forgot to. Anyway, a uh, profane surgical instrument would be one which, say, I would have reached over. That makes a sterile field contaminated, just reaching over it. Um, or would be one which had touched a used surgical instrument. That would profane one. And then um, we looked at a few weeks ago about, uh, about how unholiness is always contagious, how it always spreads. And um, it's the clean and the unclean. We also looked at something which is clean, does not purify the unclean, but is always defiled by it. So now we're going to look at Roman numeral one, what are standards? And uh, just to give a basic dictionary definition of the term standard, among other things, it does mean like a flag is uh, often referred to as a standard or a banner, especially in terms of a uh, military unit will have a standard it is under. But uh, the main definition we're looking at is an acknowledged measure of comparison for value, a criterion, if you will. A degree or level of requirement or excellence, a requirement of moral conduct. Yes? Do you make a distinction between a standard and a conviction? Um, yes, but not in this lesson. Well, that's outside of the scope of what we're evaluating today. Um, today's is not the uh, complete exhaustive list, but... Uh, is we'll be going over today building personal standards. I, just think, I don't think many people are very clear on the difference between this being what keeps us from violating convictions as opposed to this is absolutely a conviction. As in, you're, what you're asking is the uh, difference words, between the standards, the rule, Bible the commands, and the uh, reason for the standard. Yeah, I didn't use that terminology, but we're actually going over that yeah, today. Okay, good. Um, what the Bible says and how we live our lives based on it and the standard basically as we'll see here in just a second we looked at a basic definition of a standard now we're going to look at what is a biblical standard for a disciple you know you have standards in general but we're going to look at precisely what is meant by the concept of standards for a disciple of Christ an example we're going to look at is Daniel 1.8 but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested of the prince of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. So we see Daniel there. Basically he knew the Bible, and the Bible he uh, knew talks about that a believer shouldn't have fellowship with wickedness. And it talks about not eating meat sacrificed to idols. And he knew these things from his uh, study of God's law. And so, because of that, he set up a standard that he wouldn't eat the king's meat. The conclusion of all that we find in Daniel 5, 11 through 12, There is a man in thy kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy gods, and in the days of thy father light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods was found in him, whom the king Nebuchadnezzar thy father, the king, I say, thy father, made master of the magicians, astrologers, Chaldeans, and soothsayers, for as much as an excellent spirit and knowledge and understanding, interpreting of dreams and showing of hard sentences and dissolving of doubts, were found in the same Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will show the interpretation. Basically, Daniel was of an excellent spirit, and uh, it's because he wanted to have a life which was a life of excellence for God, not of mediocrity. And um, a standard is a, basically it's a rule a believer puts in his life to promote spiritual excellence. There is living a mediocre life, and then there's living a life which is trying to be excellent for God. It's uh, 
A standard for a believer is basically a personal determination based on Bible commands and principles. For instance, the Bible says that believers are not to forsake the assembling of themselves together. Therefore, because of that, because it gives that command, for example, and all of you are doing a great job keeping this one, is um, we're to be in church when the church, do church doors are open, when God's people meet. Um, Y'all are doing a great job of that. You're all here. Good job. Um, a standard... Oops. Back one. Everybody else got raptured. <laughs> a standard helps a believer discern between the holy and profane, the clean and the unclean. For instance, the Bible nowhere talks about smoking cigarettes. Well, we know it's something we shouldn't do because it's bad for us, and everybody would admit that. It's bad for your lungs to smoke cigarettes. Even the warning says, Surgeon General says that this will cause you cancer if you smoke it. But some people smoke cigarettes anyway because they're addicted to them per se. And, um, but everybody knows they're bad for you and no one would argue that they're good for you. But the Bible nowhere says, Thou shalt not smoke cigarettes. It doesn't say it anywhere. The Bible does say that believers shouldn't drink alcohol. It says, Wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging. Whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. It says, Look not thou on the wine when it is red, when it giveth his color in the cup, when it moveth itself aright. So there is no way a Bible believer can ever say that the Bible doesn't say you can't drink alcohol. It clearly says it. But the Bible does not say you should not smoke cigarettes. But the Bible does say our body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. And because of that principle of our body being the temple of the Holy Ghost, we can infer that we should not do something which would destroy the body. Therefore, a believer shouldn't smoke cigarettes. If you understand there how to build a principle like that. That's what a principle is. The Bible gives a general command and you derive specific methods of living based on that general command. Why does a disciple need standards? It's a good question. To prevent sin is the first reason. Reason number one is to prevent sin. Haggai 2, 11 through 14, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priests concerning the law, saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread or pottage or wine or oil or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priests answered and said, No. Then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priests answered and said, It shall be unclean. So basically, we went over this a few weeks ago, but if a priest has a, something which has been sacrificed to the Lord, we'll say, for example, he has a piece of that wave offering, and it's been sacrificed to the Lord, and it's been waved and everything, and now he's allowed to eat it. Who remembers the wave offering from Wednesday night a few weeks ago? Well, anyway, the priest was allowed to eat of the wave offering after it had been offered. It was something for his sustenance. So the priest has the meat. It's already been waved. It's already been offered. He's allowed to eat it, and he's got it kind of in the skirt of his garment. Imagine he kind of folds his shirt for it, if you will. You can do this with a t-shirt when collecting apples and such. At least that's what I used to do. And you can kind of fold it forward, and you can stick the meat in it, which will probably make a mess, but that's apparently what they were doing. Anyway, you've got it folded forward, and you've got the holy meat in it. Supposing then later your holy t-shirt, or the priest's skirt here, they wore flowing robes, touched bread or something later, would that garment make the things it touched pure? Nope. No. Would, uh, supposing some, an, an unclean person, supposing somebody who touches a dead body touched any of the things in the temple, would it make those things impure? Yes. yes. Would the things in the temple make the impure person, the unclean person, clean? No. 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 Dirty always destroys clean. It always messes things up. And uh, somehow this is an unbreakable law. Go ahead and apply this law to your kitchen. A dirty part of the kitchen always defiles the whole kitchen. And uh, it just does that. I know by personal experience. Anyway, um, yeah. Anyway, uh, we have standards to prevent sin in our life. The point of uh, having a standard is, you know, it prevents being contaminated with sin. You have a rule in your life which basically helps prevent you from falling into sin. That's the idea behind it. And uh, a standard must be adequately high in order to be effective. 
Another point of standards is to promote godliness, 1 Peter 1, 15-16. But as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Now standards do not cause godliness, but they promote an environment in which godliness may occur. That is, you can't be godly just because you made a sack of rules for yourself. It won't make you godly. But, you can't be godly if you don't try to be godly. Excellent biblical standards help a person to do right in questionable circumstances. By the way, mediocre biblical standards don't really help a lot. And, hmm? They lead you into sin. Yeah, it's not really a biblical standard, by the way, if it's a mediocre standard. It's... Um, the Bible always holds believers up to excellence. It never permits mediocrity. Excellent biblical standards help a believer to habitually do right to make godliness a pattern of life. Now, just living by rote doesn't automatically make a person doing right, but when you make it a habit to daily read the Bible, to daily spend time in prayer, to go to church, when you make it a habit, of doing things like having gospel tracts accessible to you so you can hand them out. When you do these sort of things, when you pattern your life in such a method, as it helps it to be godly, it allows godliness to flourish inside your life. Kind of, if you will, it's sort of like a fence around a chicken coop. The fence doesn't make the chickens grow, but it keeps the foxes out so they can't eat the chickens. If that makes sense to everybody. Who here has ever raised chickens? Alberto's raised chickens. Good job. I love chickens. They're great. Um, well, only thing dirtier than a pig. <laughs> chickens are interesting. <laughs> Some things about standards. Um, standards are not legalism. Some people ask, "What's legalism?" Well, legalism is when you decide basically to try to glorify God just by the works of the flesh. When you try to get saved by the works of the flesh, or when you try to stay, sa stay saved by the works of the flesh, or when you think that by just doing a lot of good things you can glorify God. Well, standards aren't legalism. Just because you have high standards doesn't mean you're a legalist. Sometimes people who decide to have high standards often get accused of being holier than thou, and all kinds of things, just because the people with lower standards feel convicted by the higher standards. Something interesting is standards may vary from disciple to disciple based on areas of weaknesses and degree of spiritual maturity. Now one thing about standards is not everybody is tempted by the same thing. Yep. Me, for example, I am very tempted by Oreos. If I have like a box of Oreos in the house, I will be very tempted to fall into gluttony against those Oreos. It is best for me not to have a store of Oreos up. Some people can have like just, and I've met people, they have like this whole pantry full of cookies and they barely ever eat any of them. I don't understand this, but this doesn't work for me. I would eat every Oreo in the whole pantry in one day if they were there. This is why I don't carry a store of Oreos it's because I would be very tempted by them, so I need to have a standard that I can't have huge amounts of cookies around or I eat them all. Not everybody is tempted in the same way. Some believers need to have different and higher standards about some things than others. Another thing is a newer believer may have lower standards than what he ought to have based on the culture he's saved out of. Um, if someone gets saved out of a very rough lifestyle and background, it will take longer for him in some ways to grow in Christ to become everything he ought to be. And I guess the warning here I'm trying to make is for older believers not to become too impatient with a newer believer who is perhaps struggling with many things which to us make no sense. Well, um, the goal with standards is not to conform new or immature believers to a set of standards, but to teach them the Bible that through the leading of the Holy Spirit they'll grow and develop right standards. If you teach someone the Word of God, and if they have an open heart to it, the Holy Spirit will work in their heart and teach them to be what they ought to be. Um, this doesn't mean you shouldn't try to help people with things, but on the other hand, if um, supposing a guy 
has huge long hair, wears shabby wild clothes, and he comes in the church and gets saved. The first thing you do isn't to send him to Charlie to get his hair cut and uh, send him to Alex to get a new fancy suit of clothes. The first thing is to get him a Bible and get him reading the Word of God and trying to figure out what God's Word has to say about how he should be living his life. And uh, once you change the inside, the outside will follow. This does not mean to ex ignore who we are on the outside. But an important thing to understand, too, is standards are a means, not an end. Now, the goal of a believer's life is to be like Jesus, not to have rules. This is something important. A believer, however, on the one hand, a believer's goal is not to have a bunch of rules to have rules. But on the other hand, a believer who has no standards is not like Jesus. A believer whose standards are too low, who are inadequate to keep him from sinning. And by the way, sinners, we are all sinners and we all sin, but the goal of standards is to help prevent that. But a believer who doesn't have standards will not be like Christ. The foxes will get in and eat the eggs. The chickens will be in danger, if you will. A believer who doesn't set standards, doesn't set that guardian's offenses around his life to keep himself from sinning, will fall into sin. Yes? Something that's really grievous to me is when somebody comes to you and asks you, and they, they want to analyze it down to the, is this specifically wrong? And... You know, and I, you, I hardly know the answer for it because it's not specifically wrong, but I know for a fact that the fact that they are analyzing it that way and trying to get liberty for it, that they've opened themselves up to something, and that thing specifically is going to be their spiritual failure. Uh, 100% of the time, if there's, I always just tell people, if you're struggling with it, it's wrong. If it's something that you don't have a confidence on about or that it bothers you that it might be wrong, then it is. It is wrong. And, and There's a scripture verse that says yeah. that. If you doubt, yeah, you, you let do it, it in a doubt. It, 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 but there, there's even... Romans 14. There's almost a 100% chance. I guess I shouldn't say almost. I just know when somebody will not set a standard in an area of their life that they've doubted about. In other words, what they usually try to do is they say, I doubt, and so I'm going to try to figure out how I cannot doubt. Instead of saying, because there's doubt, this is my standard. So they go the opposite. They figure out a way to remove their doubt. And Satan gets them every time. You see, Satan can't get in the head. A lot of times we think Satan's in our mind, putting thoughts in our mind. But he's, he's in our environment. He's not omnipresent the way God is. And, and where there's victory, he leaves. Where, there's, where there are standards, Satan says, well, I can't get past that fence. And he can't, he's not allowed to be there. He can't get, you know, instead of the boundary being here, the boundary's over here. And he can't get close enough to cause trouble. And he'll go somewhere where he can but he knows where there's the doubt. And you try to deal with that doubt. And you try to say, well, I don't think there's technically anything wrong with this. You, if you don't think there's technically anything wrong with it, you've already doubted it, and it is sin. And it, it is going to be your spiritual failure point. He's watching, and he knows where that is, and he's been practicing for thousands of years, and he's got thousands of minions to help him to do his work. And you'll fail. You absolutely will, 100%. And you know, I just, whenever someone asks me that question, my thought that comes to my mind is, I hope that your failure doesn't destroy you as a Christian because you will most certainly fail. Right. When they go that direction, I know they're going to fail. You know? uh, Romans 14, 23, He that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. That's actually one of the principles, principles we'll be looking at is the doubt principle. Um, not today, that'll be next week, but uh, it's a very good point. A believer who is saying, well, what's wrong with something is asking totally the wrong question. Um, the question a believer should be asking is, you know, is, well, first, what's right about something, but most importantly should be asking, what's going to glorify God the most? What is going to be the standard of excellence versus the bare minimum I can scrape by with as far as holiness, you know? And he'll never believe that that's his failure. That's true. That's what I'm saying. He'll, he'll say, well, there's nothing wrong with that. But that is where Satan got in. Yeah. That's where he got past the fence. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it'll be, he'll fail over here, but he lets Satan in right here. And he'll, and he'll always go back and say, well, I don't understand. I don't understand why I can't have victory over this. I don't understand why this keeps coming up. I don't understand why, and he won't understand. And the obvious answer is right here, you let Satan come where he didn't have a right for access. 
And so the failure is never in kind. He's too smart for that. I mean, people think that they can play games with Satan, who's way more intelligent and who has got, oh, I don't know, about 6,000 years more experience at least, maybe 7,000 or more than we do. And um, he's pretty wily. That's true. About um, standards, works cannot make us godly, Galatians 2.21 for I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness has come by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. But disciples are predestinated to good works. Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Right. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. The book of Ephesians is all about predestination, and that's predestination to good works. Read chapter 1, talks about predestination. God's predestined that those who get saved are going to glorify God. And um, when we set up standards, our point is, is to permit good works to be able to function and happen in our lives. And uh, how to set biblical standards. And this isn't like an exhaustive, all-out, whole lesson on it, but a brief overview on it. Um, something about effective standards. Uh, three things about them. One, an effective standard is derived from Bible commands and principles. And the corollary of that is if your standards are not derived from the Bible, then they aren't going to work. An effective standard is high enough that it prevents sin. And uh, an effective standard is also made with common sense. You know, we're not, we can't quite live in a monastery, but uh, don't allow, say for instance, um, on I-95, there are signs with bad content in them. However, to try to live in Broward County and not drive on I-95 would be extremely difficult. So the standard is, is you watch the traffic, not any potential bad signs, not you don't ever drive on I-95, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, we as believers need to tell people how to get saved. Unfortunately, sometimes the people are trying, how, trying to tell how to get saved on door to door behave in, or dressed in, or um, say perhaps they're sitting on their front porch drinking a beer, or smoking a cigarette, or doing other things which uh, aren't good things for us to be involved in. But, well, we still need to be telling them how to get saved. Now if someone's drunk, there's no point in trying. It's best just to leave a tract and leave. But um, the point is, is that a person needs to have some sense in how they make their standards. Um, but standards being too high is pretty much never the case. It's very, very infrequent that someone makes a standard that they can't, you know. Some people make standards they just can't live up to. And usually the problem there is not that they set too high a standard. The problem is that they set the goals. They made too many standards and forgot about Christ. So, you know, you need to make your standards simple enough that they're livable, but they need to be Christ-centered, but they also need to be high enough that they'll work if you understand what I'm meaning. If you have like a list this long of all the standards you could possibly have, it's going to be really hard to um, fig figure out what they are and keep them. But if you don't have standards for the things in your life, for the aspects of your life, then, um, then you're not going to be successful in preventing sin. A believer ought to have standards about what media they allow in their lives. And uh, that's kind of extra. It didn't get in here, but it, Add it on your notes, if you will. The media you allow in your life, you need to have standards about it. And um, you need to dig in God's Word and figure out what it says about it. A great verse about what media to allow in your life is Philippians uh, 4.8. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue and if there be any praise, think on these things. That's a good way to evaluate what sort of things we allow into our lives. The eye gate, the ear gate, this is what comes into the mind, and this is what affects how we think. Um, that's kind of an extra there. It's not in the notes, but uh, a believer does need to have standards about those sort of things. I will set no wicked thing before my eye is a Bible standard, as a Bible command, I mean. Um, there's a verse in Proverbs which talks about, uh, Cease, my son, to hear the words that cause thee th to err from... The uh, what? How's it go? It's basically it says to cease. Cease, my son, to hear the 
words of instruction that causeth thee to err from the paths of judgment. Something like that. Basically, don't listen to something which is trying to teach you to live wickedly. Be careful about what philosophies you allow in your life. Um, about Bible-based standards, making your standards Bible-based, every standard must have a Bible command to back it. I once heard somebody telling their kid, well, there was a song which the kid liked. And uh, the mom told the kid, well, that's a bad song. <clears throat> the kid was like, why? Well, the mom told the kid, well, because other songs on that CD, there's another song in that CD, which is a bad song, so that's a bad song because the first song on the CD was, you know, song A is bad because song B is on the CD and song B is a bad song. There were other reasons and much better ones than that. That's an ineffective standard because it's just kind of made up out of thin air. It's not a Bible standard. Um, it wasn't very effective and it unfortunately didn't keep the kid out of trouble. Uh, the real standard was, um, wherefore come out from among them and be separate. The Bible does talk about music and about what sort of music standards we should have, but that's not for this week. That's two weeks from now. Um, we'll look at in detail a detailed explanation about what the Bible says about it because it is such a major part of our lives. Now, the way to have ideal, excellent standards is to know the Word of God. You will not be pleasing to God if you do not know what God says about how to be pleasing to Him. That makes sense, doesn't it? If you don't know what God says in His Word, you won't be able to be who you're supposed to be before Him. <coughs> Some Bible standards. Come on in. Good to have you guys. Some Bible standards in which to base our principles... <coughs> Here's some uh, things about principles. Brother Kent, would you get them a uh, set of the notes for Sunday school, please? Glad to have you guys. We're looking at a uh, culture of the cross, the lifestyle of a disciple of Jesus Christ. And um, today we're looking at about some Bible standards and principles. And uh, about principles is what is a Bible principle? What does it mean? What do they do? Um, it's on the back side of the sheet of notes there. Uh, principles are general commands of Scripture which show God's desire for how we're to live in specific areas. A principle is general, but a standard is specific. Yes. The Bible has a principle. We set a specific standard based on what the Bible says concerning that area. Like, um, for instance, the Bible doesn't say one word in the world about internet. The word internet is not found in the Bible. The word web is. The internet's a giant web waiting to entangle you, I heard one evangelist explain. <laughs> You're entering a net! I, I thought it was kind of funny, but uh, well the Bible has a whole lot to say about how you should browse about the internet though. Piles of things to say about godliness and avoiding what is evil. But uh, principles are general, a standard is specific, so now we're going to look at some general principles on which we can build all areas of our lives. Number two is God's Word does not have a specific command for every possible circumstance or decision we can make. I hate it when people say, well, the Bible doesn't say I can't do that. Well, the Bible can't say every single possible thing in the whole wide world. But the Bible does cover every single aspect of our lives. The Bible is sufficient for everything we need to live a life of godliness. Um, 2 Timothy 3.16, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished to all good works. First principle we're going to look at is the identification principle. I think we're only going to get through two principles today. The identification principle, and if I spelled principle in the notes anyway, like a high school principle, forgive me, I think I went through and made sure it's all right, but if you'll look carefully just to make sure so I can fix it. The identification principle, I put three passages here. The one we'll look at is 1 John 2, 15 through 17. The Bible says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. 
So of these passages, 1 John identifies for us that there are two sides, the Father's side and the world's side. Romans 6, 1 through 12, um, discusses about us living the new life in Christ, about us identifying with Christ as we've been buried with him in death, so we are raised to walk in newness of life. James 4.4 4 talks about um, friendship with the world is enmity with God. So we know that uh, there are two sides, and the identification principle talks about which side do you look like. Defined. The identification principle defined is identifying with Jesus Christ through the way we live, things we do, the culture we express. Now a person can express different cultures. Supposing I wore a sombrero. Sombreros are great, you know, like a big black sombrero with like silvery little uh, trimmings all around on it. That would express a very Latin American culture, a very Mexican to be specific culture. Um, and uh, I need a good Sunday school sombrero, but um, I don't know if I could pull it off. Anyway, uh, how we are, the things we do in our life, all do express a certain culture. The question we need to ask ourselves is, by liking, or doing, or being, or experiencing, or enjoying something, who does it make me more like, a disciple of Christ, or a person of the world? Or ask yourself this question, whose uniform am I wearing, God's or the world's? That's what this principle of identification is, we looked at, is, uh, is who are you making yourself to identify with? Who are you looking like? Whose side are you on? There was a period in the Civil War when um, uh, Thomas Stonewall Jackson's troops managed to defeat a very sizable Union army and capture a whole bunch of goods and supplies in uh, what is now West Virginia. Now the Confederate armies at the moment were, well they pretty much were always under supplied and equipped, but Stonewall Jackson's men had a severe lack of uniforms. They captured a whole wagon loads of Yankee uniforms and they started putting them on to the point where it was hard to tell whose side who was on. Uh, well, Stonewall Jackson made a rule that anyone wearing a Yankee uniform was to be shot immediately and so his men had to stop and go back to the ragged clothes. Well, the point was is that they were, even though they were on the right side, they were identifying with the wrong side if you will. When we as believers identify with the wrong side, we put ourselves in the position of being the enemy of God. Applied. Well, the minor details of what is in our lives should be Christ-like. Now, people often talk about, well, it's just a little thing. Aiken thought so too about hiving the Babylonian garments. The little things can get us in trouble. Um, the minor details of what is in our lives needs to be Christ-like, and what we express through our lifestyle must show the character of Christ. That is, the things we do with our life, they should be Christ-like. They should identify with Christ. Um, this isn't quite the same as testimony. Our testimony has a lot to do with our reputation, too, but the point is, is if... Um, how we live ought to clearly show Christ, it ought to promote Christ. For instance, if I had a Coca-Cola t-shirt on, what would I be promoting? Coca-Cola. The way I live my life ought to be promoting Christ, and it ought not to be having things in it which are of the enemies of Christ. The Christ who loved us, who died for us on the cross, who gave himself for us, he shouldn't have to be offended by things in our lives which are of the enemies who hate him. If you think about that. Should we uh, help the ungodly and love those that hate the Lord? It was a question the prophet Jehu asked Jehoshaphat. And uh, the answer very clearly is, if we develop tastes for those things which are of the people who hate the Lord, we're putting ourselves in a really bad position before God. Supposing you have a really good friend, we'll say Charlie for instance, Charlie's a great friend of mine, and supposing Charlie, we'll say supposing he lived down the street and there was a neighbor who hated Charlie, who constantly did everything he could to try to ruin poor Charlie. Supposing 
I was best friends with that neighbor. You think that would be kind of awkward for poor Charlie? Like if I started hanging around with that neighbor? Yeah. Started identifying with that neighbor? <clears throat> That'd be betraying Charlie. Now, through how we walk, talk, say, what we do, what we wear, what we listen to, watch, read, learn, all these aspects of how we live, need, they need to identify with the cross, not with the enemies of the cross. We'll be going on in the next week about more principles, but how we live our life needs to identify with the cross, not with the enemies of the cross. The things we do with our life determine who we are in fellowship with. Are we in fellowship with God or with the devil? 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 19 through 21 says, What say I then, that the idol is anything, or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? What's he talking about here in the context? Eating meat offered to idols. Eating meat offered to idols. The Corinthians at, at the church in Corinth, at First Baptist Church of Corinthia, had a problem with eating meat offered to idols. And they were like, well, so what? It's just meat offered to idols. It's just meat. What does it matter if I eat it or not? Paul says, what say I then? Is that the idol is anything? No, idols aren't nothing. Or that which is idol offered and sacrificed to idols is anything. No, it's not nothing either, if you'll excuse it. Um, idols aren't real. They're false. The earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. But I say that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to devils and not to God. And I would not that ye should have fellowship with devils. It's a serious verse, ain't it? Should we as believers have fellowship with devils? Ye cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of devils. Ye cannot be partakers of the Lord's table and of the table of devils. The problem in the church at Corinth is people were eating meat offered to idols. And um, this is very dishonoring to God. And, uh, well, that was the issue of the time was eating meat offered to idols. We don't really have that problem anymore, at least not in general here in the States. Um, however... There are other things we do have problems with. There are other issues and other pro problems which come up. Um, there are things which can enter the life of a believer which make us to be like the world, which bring us into fellowship with ungodliness and make us the friends of devils instead of the friends of Christ, which set us at enmity with the cross. And so think about, what about the media we've been allowing into our lives? What sides it bringing us into fellowship with? Think about that. What about the stuff you like? Who sides it on? Next principle we're going to look at. I don't know if we're going to get through fully. We are almost out of time. 1 Corinthians 10, 23 says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful to me, but all things edify not. First principle, identification. Whose side are you on? Second principle is edification. What's an edifice? It's a building. It's a building, something which is built up. Does it build up is the point. Edification is being built up in Christ. Colossians 2, 6 through 7. What's that verse talk about? Colossians 2. About What's it talk about, Charlie? Well, being rooted and established in Christ and not, not, not You'll grab your bulletin. It's actually right on the front. Someone read the front bulletin cover for me. Go ahead and read it out loud, Charlie. You, you see Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in and root and build up in him, and establish in the faith as you have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. Um, the Bible talks extensively about us being built up in Christ, and this principle covers, so you have something in your life and you're trying to figure out, is this godly or is this ungodly? So the question you can ask is, does this build me up does this build others up? Or is this something which edifies? And uh, the thing is, is uh, first, what we do affects what sort of person we are. It affects the lifestyle we have affects what sort of person we are. If I have the lifestyle of a robber, I'm a robber. It doesn't matter. Well, I hear people say this all the time, but I'm really a good person inside. No, a person who steals is a dirty, rotten robber. And a person who lies is a dirty, rotten liar, and a person who kills is a dirty, rotten murderer. 
It amazes me reading the testimonies of murderers at their trials. I feel so bad that I did this. I'm not really this angry inside. I'm really such a good person. I feel so bad I killed your family and did horrible things. No, that really is who you are. If, if you do bad things, you really are a bad person. So, is what you're doing in your life building you up in Christ or making you worser, if you will? Is it making you less built up? Um, we are not an island. First, what we do affects us. Two, what we do affects other people. We are not an island. Everything we do affects those who are around us. We must build up others in Christ by how we live. And what we permit in our life must build up ourselves and others in Christ. If we let something in our lives, it ought to be something which is building us up and building others up. If we're going to have a life of excellence, we shouldn't just seek to be in neutral and doing what it pleases us. We should be seeking to do what is godly, glorifies God, a principle we'll look at next week, and um, is edifying and builds up others and furthers and promotes the cause of Christ. That is it for this week's Sunday School lesson. Next week we'll be looking at several more principles. Be looking forward to Brother Charlie's series on um, the history of, well, basically I think I titled the Sunday School lesson, Why I Am an Independent Baptist. Charlie might have a better title for it, but that's what I called it. And so, um, basically, uh, why is this church an independent Baptist church? I think that's a good question, and uh, I hope we'll have some very good answers for it. Let's pray. Dear God, thank you for uh, giving us the great privilege to be disciples of you. Help us to be disciples who glorify you with our lives and help us to be people who live according to your word, who uh, let your word change who we are. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. What is a What is a crochet? Or tired or whatever it is. But we're going to say a word of prayer in a minute and ask God just to really help us with our services here this morning. We had such a wonderful week last week and whenever you put so much effort and time, I think it wears people out and wears them down. But let's see if we can uh, make sure that we get what we came here for this morning and that is for God to speak to our heart to move and to do great things. Thank you so much for being here this morning. I'm so grateful for every person that has taken the time to worship with us here today. And I'm anticipating that God is going to do something in our midst here. I believe that every person that has come here today did not do so by accident, but because you were led by God to be here. And if God led you to come here today, then I think that it naturally follows that He's going to speak to us and He's going to do a work here. And so let's anticipate that, look forward to that. Let me get some announcements out of the way here very briefly, just some things with who we are and what we do. But you couldn't exactly say this is why it's right. And let me just make a statement that is not meant to offend anyone or to be arrogant or anything like that. But I believe that we're right about what we believe and what we are as a church. I believe that it is scriptural and biblical to be Baptist. Now, let me qualify that and make a statement, and Charlie will prove this. Okay, so Charlie, anything I say, you have to prove, which I really appreciate. I can make any... Hey, that's kind of fun. Make unqualified <laughs> statements, and Charlie will qualify them. This is going to be good. Uh, let me just say this. Uh, not every Baptist is independent. Not every Baptist is independent. And uh, But... An independent Baptist is non-denominational. Did you know that? Uh, independent Baptists were non-denominational before there ever was the concept of being non-denominational. Most Baptists that call themselves independent are not. There are Baptists that are part of the Fundamental Baptist Fellowship, that are far, part of the General Association of uh, Regular Baptists, there are, that are part of the Bible Baptist Fellowship, and so forth. And I just want to tell you something, not be, meant to be a slam or anything unkind, but they're not independent. And I believe that the doctrine of autonomy is very, very important Bible doctrine. And that will be one of the things that Brother Charlie teaches from a biblical perspective. We're not going to be Baptist at you. I can't stand Baptistisms. You know what I'm talking about, the people that are, bless God, Baptist, amen, uh, kind of thing. That's nonsense. That's, that's ridiculous. It's not in the Bible. But I am Baptist because I want people to know what it is that we believe as a church. I want people, when they come into our church, to know uh, why we are what we are. And it's not because we picked. It's not because we chose. It's because of conviction. And there's a difference in that. Our Sunday school class is meant to uh, honestly just be an honest, 
this is what the scripture says and this is why we are what we are. And honestly, I don't mean to be uh, too independent about it, but it doesn't really matter to me what anyone else is. We are not what we are because of someone who's wrong. We are what we are because of what the Bible teaches. And so if you come to our church and you've liked the preaching, you've liked the teaching, you like a lot of the things that we do here, uh, let me just say they're not by accident. It's not because, well, this is what happened uh, because of, you know, this is just our tradition or these are the people that we knew and how they influenced us. But it really, there are a lot of things that we do that are because of Bible conviction. And we want to be helpful to you in that. So every now and again, we'll teach a topical Sunday school like that. That would be something that would kind of help you to know where you are and what you believe. And there's a lot of trends today that uh, really attack straw men and destroy them, but they don't deal with the issues. And so that's what we want to do with the Sunday school class. Brother Charlie is the right man to do it. He's the, he is our Baptist scholar in our church. It's, so he'll qualify everything that I've said. You come back and you'll see it's going to be good. Not next week, what, three weeks? It's like three weeks. Three weeks from now, he'll begin that. Of course, don't forget our Culture of the Cross Sunday School. Now let me mention a couple of uh, things that are going on that are nearer than that that you could be uh, involved with and praying for. First of all, Brother Nick's going to preach tonight. Usually I ask Brother Nick to preach, and that means I'm not going to be here. I never get to hear Nick when he preaches here. And so uh, this evening he's going to preach, and I'm going to be here and hear him preach. And so you folks come back and hear Nick preach. And I'm going to tell you something. If you're not here tonight, it's because you don't like Nick. And so I, I, I'm going to take it very personally. So you either be here or you don't like Nick. So <laughs> there you go. Look around, Brother Nick, and see who's here this morning. If they're not here, it's because they don't like you. And so um, I just don't know how else to put it. All right. And so uh, please come back this evening. I know what he's going to preach about, and it'll be good. Uh, and then this coming week, we're going to be going to uh, do our scripture printing in uh, South Carolina. And so we're looking forward to that. We would ask that you be in prayer for us. We've got a lot to accomplish this week. And specifically this, we're going to Calvary Hill Baptist Press. We're going to be using a lot of their equipment and working with them to print our Genesis, John, and Romans for our uh, marathon project. Here are some things that we need prayer about. Uh, Friday evening, Brother uh, Gary called me. And he said that their uh, book binder broke down or the thing that glues the book backs. They've got a manual one that takes a little more time to use. He was really upset about it. He says, Brother, I just want to give you a heads up on this is going down. I think God's going to take care of that. I don't think it's really an issue. And if everything that we plan on getting done this week doesn't get accomplished, it's not the end of the world. It'll get done, and we'll have enough Bibles that we can start our marathon project distribution and all that. So it's not going to stop us. But sure, it would be nice if things went smoothly. And so we're going to ask the Lord for that. Will you pray for us? If you're not going on that trip, there will be five of us that will be going on that trip to do the scripture printing this week. And we need you to pray that we'll be effective, that we'll be a good testimony, and that the Lord will just really use us in our lives. I believe that scripture printing is the job of the local church. We have trouble with scripture and what people believe about the Bible because people that don't believe the Bible are the ones that are responsible for printing. And this is a matter of conviction for us, and so we're trying to do something about it and get involved with it. And the Lord's led us into this project and we're really looking forward to it okay and then one more thing that's coming up and this will be uh, exciting i think you're going to look forward to next sunday morning we're going to have uh, brother philip rizzo with us and he's a church planter to hoboke is it hoboke is that hoboken i have trouble with that word it's in it's across it's where they take the picture of the manhattan skyline they're planning a church there and they're planning i believe on starting that church this fall and Brother Phil Rizzo is going to be with us on this Sunday. Here's some things specifically that you could pray about. First of all, pray that our church will be a blessing to their ministry. I know what it is to plant a church, and I know what it is to combat skeptics. Nobody, you know, first of all, God makes church planters a little bit nuts, just to begin with. They, they try to do things that are just not, not normal, but people are all the time trying to convince them that they're nuts. And I would tell you, if you're planning on planting a church in Hoboken, you've got to be a little bit crazy. It's incredibly expensive, it's incredibly a hostile place to preach the gospel, and it's a place that God needs and God wants a local church to be like this one. So it is a big deal. So pray for Brother Rizzo that our church will encourage them, that when they come here that, and present that ministry, that we, God will use us in a way that would let them know, uh, or just that would just really encourage them. And then secondly, pray that God will give us an avenue to help them, to be a help to their ministry. And that's really our desire. And then, of course, you be here. It's going to be exciting. He's a good preacher. And we're looking forward to having them with us this next week. Teen activity this Saturday is kickball. And accusations made by people who actually are guilty of the things they accuse us of. They say Baptists are all about numbers. 
That's what they say. Now, I'll tell you, I go door to door in this town. I knock on a church, invite people to Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church. And people, particularly from a certain church in town, say, well, we don't go to a Baptist church. We go to a church that's Baptistic in doctrine, but we've fixed the Baptist. And uh, here are some problems with you Baptists. You're all about numbers. And the second thing is you're all about the offering. You're all about taking up an offering. In our church, we don't take up an offering. We just put collection thing in the back, and people can give that way. And it's, it's the same thing, by the way. It's just a different way of collecting. Uh, but it's interesting if you go on their church's website that they post their attendance and they post their offering on their website. And so um, I just want to say about that, I don't think that's a very nice thing to say, and it hurts my feelings. I almost cry every time they do it, and um, I'm being a little sarcastic this morning. But I do want to tell you something. We do take up an offering in our church on purpose and for a reason, and let me just explain that to you, and then I'll, I'll make a qualification for it. The reason we take up an offering is because the Bible says to. In other words, if there were no other reason to take up an offering this morning, if it had nothing to do with collection for the ministering to the saints and taking care of the work of the ministry, we take up an offering because it's one of the things that's commanded to do on the Lord's Day. We take up an offering on Sunday for the same reason that we go to church on Sunday, and that's because it is the day that we celebrate the resurrection. Jesus Christ is alive. We're alive in Christ. And the fact that we participate in offering as a form of, of worship is an acknowledgement that we're alive in Christ, that we are bought with a price, that we're stewards of God's resources. And the Bible says on the first day of the week, let every man lay by him in store according as the Lord hath prospered him, that there be no gathering when I come. If you'll study that, you'll find that it was for the collection, for the ministering to the saints at Jerusalem, and it was for the work of the ministry. That's what the offering in our church is, and it's a part of worship. And so I hope that this morning as you're here, that you don't see this as this is them trying to get some money, but rather instead, this is our opportunity to show God that we are, or this is our opportunity to worship Him. This is our opportunity to be obedient to something that's commanded in the Scripture. The second reason we take up an offering is because uh, this is the way that the church is supported. This is, this is where we pay our bills. You won't find us at Walmart selling hot dogs or on the street uh, trying to get money from people that aren't a part of our ministry. I believe this, I say it all the time, I believe a ministry is not support, worth supporting then the people in it won't support it, and they shouldn't. But if it is worth supporting, then you should. And so we, if you're visiting with us here this morning, let me just say this. We don't believe it's your responsibility to support this local church. We believe it's ours, and we're honored that you've come to be guests with us. We would invite you, if you would like to worship the Lord through giving this morning, to participate in our offering. But we wouldn't at all pressure you to do so and wouldn't feel as though it's something that you uh, would have any kind of a responsibility to do. And so, uh, for the folks that are regularly a part of our local church, we would ask that you would do two things as you give this morning. We would ask that you would give prayerfully. Of course, please don't just give and not pray about it. Pray and say, Lord, what would you have me to give? And then we would just ask you to obey God in that. You know, God loves obedience, and He'll be honored by it. And if we obey God in the matter of giving this morning, it will make our worship service uh, just go that much better. And God will be pleased by it. We're here this morning to worship the Lord. And so this is a part of our worship, and I hope everyone understands that this morning. Let's go ahead and pray and ask the Lord's blessing on the offering. Alex.